This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Following his graduation in 1859, Tchaikovsky took a job in the Ministry of Justice. He made new friends. This was never a problem to him. He made friends easily, though he frequently denied this, and he enjoyed a rich and varied social life. As one friend put it, It was quite impossible not to love him. Everything, starting with his youthful appearance and his marvellous intense gaze, made him irresistibly attractive. But above all, it was his striking modesty and his touching kindness. No other person could treat everyone so cordially. No one else possessed such a childlike, pure and bright view of people. Everyone felt, in talking with him, a special warmth and caress in the sound of his voice, in his words, and in his glance. But behind his charm and apparent pleasure in conviviality lay a kind of quiet, almost lazy fatalism, very Russian, very romantic. In addition to his now habitual use of tobacco and alcohol was another weakness which never left him and of which he himself was well aware. When I have money in my pocket, I always squander it on pleasures. This is base and foolish, I know. Strictly speaking, I can have no money at all for pleasures. There are enormous debts demanding payment. There are necessities of the very first order. But I, because of my weakness, disregard all this and enjoy myself. Such is my character. But how shall I end? I know that sooner or later, and more likely sooner... I shall lose the strength to struggle with the difficult side of life and shall smash myself to pieces. But until then I enjoy life as I can and sacrifice everything to enjoyment. By this time the possibility of his switching from the law to music as a profession was high on the agenda, though his father's inability to support him effectively ruled it out, at least for the moment. But Tchaikovsky was now determined to further his capacities as a musician, and in 1861 he enrolled in a class at the Russian Musical Society, which one year later was established as the St. Petersburg Conservatory, under the directorship of Anton Rubinstein, perhaps the greatest Russian pianist of the 19th century, and a noted composer as well. Rubinstein gave him every encouragement to take the plunge, and in 1863, he was now 23, Tchaikovsky resigned from his post at the Ministry of Justice and enrolled as a full-time student at the conservatory. But for all his charm and modesty, for all his much-remarked generosity of spirit, he was a young man of very strong opinions. During this period, Pyotr Ilyich had a great many unhealthy musical antipathies, these related not just to composers, but to whole genres or composition, and more exactly, to their sound. Thus, for instance, he did not like the sound of piano with orchestra, the sound of a string quartet or quintet, and most of all, the sound of the piano in combination with one or several stringed instruments. Not just once, nor ten times, nor a hundred times, did I hear from him what was almost an oath that he would never compose a single piano concerto, or a single sonata for violin and piano, or a single trio, quartet, and so on. It's even stranger that about this very time he gave a pledge never to compose either short piano pieces or romances. Well, those aversions he overcame. His first piano concerto became one of the most popular ever written, his string quartets are still played, one of them moved Tolstoy to tears, his piano trio has never been out of the repertoire, and the same goes for a number of his many short piano pieces. His tastes in composers, though, never wavered, and from his early childhood Mozart was the runaway favorite. I love Mozart as a musical Christ. Incidentally, he lived just about as long as Christ. I don't think there is anything sacrilegious in this comparison. He was such an angelic creature of such childlike purity. His music is so filled with a beauty which is unattainably sublime that if anyone can be mentioned in the same breath as Christ, then it is Mozart. In talking about Beethoven, I have stumbled upon Mozart. It is my profound conviction that Mozart is the loftiest peak of perfection which beauty has attained in the sphere of music. No one has his ability to make me weep, to make me tremble with rapture from the knowledge that I am close to something which we call the ideal.